Hello, everyone. Welcome to our discussion, likely timely discussion of the Ukraine-Russian ongoing conflict. I've titled this what we know so far, specifically with the intent that it's developing and we don't know um, what may be ahead. I am Dr. RJ Grow, and I am a faculty member in the Department of Political Science and Public Service um, here at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Um, the other panelists that you see, Dr. Said Golkar, Dr. Yurina Kamelko, and Dr. Jessica Ochter, um, we are here to uh, provide some background, some feedback. Dr. Kamelko will be the primary on providing the feed, uh, the providing information on Ukraine and Russia. And then um, we are also here as panelists for both security. Dr. Ochter will be teaching a class in the spring, excuse me, in the fall that I believe on American foreign policy. Uh, Dr. Golkar and I both teach um, both soft security and hard security as well. So we are here um, and uh, we welcome questions. So do feel free to put them in the chat. I will also serve as moderator. And um, uh, Dr. Kamelko, if you would like to begin, I will uh, feed us questions as they become available and um, we welcome the discussion. Uh, well, uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon already, everybody. Um, I see uh, Susan, you still, okay, I see that everybody is here. Uh, well, um, it, it's a good morning here in Chattanooga, so I'm glad to uh, just to see everybody and uh, to discuss uh, the most recent developments and what led to the current crisis in, uh, in Ukraine and share with you the latest uh, that uh, I know. Let me share my screen and begin my, I will take about uh, maybe uh, maybe 10 to 12 minutes, My present, that, that will be the length of my presentation. So let me share my screen, I'll share. Okay, sharing my screen. And uh, well, now we're slideshow from the beginning. Okay, I'm not sure how to make this uh, screen. Okay, I, I know. Okay, so we are talking about Russia and Ukraine and the Ukrainian crisis, unfolding Ukrainian cr crisis. And we will be talking about what we know so far. This is the map of Ukraine I wanted to share with you. This is the capital city of Ukraine that I hear so far and a lot. This is Chernobyl. This is the site of the most dramatic uh, disaster, nuclear disaster. You could see Belarus, Russia in here. This is the Crimea. Uh, the, that is the region that was occupied by Russia. And this is Donetsk and Luhansk region. region regions that are controlled by the Russian-backed uh, separatists. On this side of the map on the west, you see, of course, Moldova, Hungary, uh, you see multiple countries, Poland. This is really where right now a lot of uh, uh, those refugees are piling. The line is probably 40, 45 hours at the minimum. You see Slovakia. Uh, a lot of people who ran uh, and who, who are actually running from the Russians are right here at Ushgorod. That's, that's the city where people are. And of course, this is the Black Sea uh, on the south. So Ukraine is surrounded right now uh, from the side, Russians are taking from the side of Belarus. Uh, in Moldova, they occupied this territory a long time ago and they're taking Ukraine from here. They are taking from south, and of course, they are taking from everywhere in Russia. I wanted to show you sunflowers, and I will tell you the meaning of sunflowers sh shortly, uh, because you probably, if you watched the State of the Union address yesterday by President Biden, you saw the First Lady um, having um, a, a, a little sunflower on, on her sleeve. Sunflower is the source of... Uh, uh, of um, oil uh, for, for Ukrainians. It's the same as uh, what olive oil is for Italians. Uh, people also eat it. They just literally take the sunflower and when it's ripe, it's very tasty actually, you can eat it. Right now you would see Ukrainians offering sunflowers to, um, uh, to, to uh, Russian troops. And if you think, uh, if, if you are wondering why, 
uh, sunflower has such a strong significance that even the first lady put it on her sleeve. Well, they give it and they ask uh, Russians to put it into their uh, into their pockets. So when they're buried on the Ukrainian territory, they uh, they basically uh, something good will come out of it. The sunflower will grow from that seed. Uh, at this time, I would like to ask uh, Susan. We were talking about um, uh, to sharing the link. Uh, please share the link with our participants, and I would like everybody mute their microphones and I will mute mine and please let's watch for two minutes, 30 seconds only. And then I will meet you on the other side. So. Welcome to beautiful city of Kiev. My name is Julia and I'm gonna be our guide here. Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, is one of the most fascinating and underrated places in all Europe. Today, we're gonna show you the best places to visit. So watch this video till the end. Kryshatik, the main street of Kiev, took its name from the word Christ. Here you can find a lot of bars, restaurants, cafes, and world-known brand shops. So I recommend you to start exploring Kiev from this place. There is also a huge shopping mall underground where you can find almost everything from souvenirs to food and groceries. And this is St. Andrew Church, one of the most gorgeous churches in Kiev located in the Podil district. To get to it, people must walk up to Andreevsky Dyson, which is a major tourist attraction where you can buy typical Ukrainian souvenirs. From this place, we can see all Podil and Dnipro River. After visiting St. Andrew Church, you can continue and go directly to a landscape alley. It's a free entrance park for kids and adults full of heroes from different fairy tales and cartoons. Overlooking the Dnipro River is the Pechersk Lavra. This monastery complex is known for its iconic golden domes, one of the most notable elements of the Kiev skyline. It was built in the 11th century as an important center of Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and it attracts millions of tourists and pilgrims every year. Standing proudly at the top of a hill is the statue of the strong lady, the Motherland. It was installed in 1981 to honor the heroes of Soviet Union. And she is exactly 17 meters higher than her colleague in New York, the Statue of Liberty. For a small fee, you can get to the very top and enjoy the most breathtaking view of Kiev. This Soviet-style monument is actually a steel rainbow that symbolizes friendship between two nations, Russians and Ukrainians. All of this place is monumental complex. You can see a lot of different things here. Everybody should be done with the two minutes, 30 seconds of the video. You can finish it on your own. So let me share the screen again and continue uh, with, uh, with, with my um, presentation. Um, so let me give you a little background on Ukraine. Uh, very quickly, I'll go through some of the main uh, facts about Ukraine. Population is about 43, almost 44 million, uh, predominantly ethnic Ukrainians, but there is a Russian, Belarusian, Moldovan, Tatar, Bulgarian, Hungarian, Romanian. So you see a list of multiple nationalities. Ukrainian is an official language of the land. About 67% uh, of the population are native in this language. However, uh, 29, close to 30% speak Russian. And of course, there are other groups of the population. Oh yeah, the slideshow, let's see. On current slide. Um, a religion, predominantly the population of Ukraine are Christian Orthodox. If you're not familiar, it's one of the five main religions on the planet Earth and uh, the Ukrainian Orthodoxy, they started with the uh, very similar to uh, what Catholicism is, but it's a more relaxed religion. For example, priests can marry, they can actually divorce, uh, and uh, a lot of other things are more, but it's very similar in some ways to, uh, to, the, um, to, 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 to the Catholicism. 
Um, you can see the age structure in Ukraine, the majority of population are between 25 and 54 years old. Uh, the median age, you could see that uh, the total is 41, but uh, 41 years old. Uh, it's a negative population uh, growth, so people, obviously, the times are hard, so no, few children. Uh, Ukraine is a democracy. It's a hybrid time of a governmental, uh, hybrid type of a governmental system. Uh, so basically what it means that Ukrainians have a president, but they also have prime minister. So presidential systems usually, like in the United States, have president, but uh, parliamentary such as, for example, UK have a uh, uh, prime minister. So Ukraine has actually both. Uh, all this uh, story starts uh, and what we see right now, such a dramatic development. The story started with the hunger strikes for independence. You could see some pictures on, uh, on the screen. And these are the pictures of students uh, that started with students on the main square. You've seen it in uh, the video and you've seen it multiple times it's called independence square in, in kiev ukraine and what it says here i'm on strike i am basically the, it's a hunger strike and they, these students really took it seriously uh ambulances were running back and forth some died so this is more this is the main square that you've seen they put a tenth cd and says hunger strike for democracy so it's right before ukrainian independence which happened on December 1st, 1991, Ukrainians went for a referendum and decided to separate from Russia. That was a dramatic development in Ukraine. Absolute majority of the population decided to separate from Russia and move towards West. Many people are usually uh, thinking that uh, and, and telling me that that's because Ukrainians were either hungry that was not it. Uh, the main reason why people was wanted to separate from Russia was to go for freedom and liberty for all. They wanted to go towards democracy, the Western style democracy. Uh, Ukrainians, I lived in Ukraine for probably, I don't know, 25, almost 30 years. Uh, nobody was going hungry. The, the shelves was not empty. It's a misinformation if you think that the last 25 years in Ukraine people were starving. Nobody was starving. The quality was, of food was outstanding. Uh, nobody would buy yogurt that is more than one day old. Everything was organic. Uh, so it was not food. It was not really anything related to food, but it was freedom that people wanted. Uh, in 1994, another major development, Ukraine had at that time the second largest arsenal of nuclear weapons. Ukraine decided to give up those weapons voluntarily uh, in return for the West uh, promising to guarantee territorial integrity. On this picture, you see President Yeltsin, who was president of Russia, President Clinton, who was president of the United States at that time, Ukrainian President Kuchma, and here is the prime minister of UK, all sign that they will guarantee territorial integrity of Ukraine if Ukraine gives us uh, gives up nuclear weapons. In 96, Ukrainians ratified new constitution, so they lived in this space between the constitutions from 1991 to 1996, and it was a huge celebration at that time. Then 2004 comes, and it's an orange revolution. That's when people believe that there was flawed election. So there was a huge revolution at that time. Again, you can see this uh, independence square uh, covered uh, with people. Manifest. There, it was all over Ukraine. 2008, uh, Russians invade Georgia uh, in a very similar way that they were attacking uh, Ukraine, except they didn't go to the capital city of the Belize at that time. And now they are attacking the capital city of Ukraine. Um, in 19, uh, 2013, I'm going through very major developments in Ukraine that actually related the elect directly to the current developments in Ukraine. So 2013, 2014, Euromaidan, uh, so Euro Square, that is when um, uh, Ukrainians went again on this main square. You see it's all on fire. Uh, at the end, then you could see, of course, uh, military personnel present. And you see the fire all over the, the downtown Kyiv and all over Ukraine. This is when Ukrainians decided to go for European integration. Uh, and this is really where Putin and Kremlin started to prepare to basically use force to bring Ukraine back. This is again, Euromaidan, you see European flags, 
Ukrainian flags. You see Ukrainians on the streets, a lot of uh, uh, barricades. You see barricades. People were fighting to join European Union and go away from Russia. At that time, there was a pro-Russian president. So they ousted the pro-Russian president who ran to Moscow and hid in Russia. And then they, of course, this is still Euromaidan, the same square as you've seen in the video. And the major development, look at this. This is the map of Crimea. And Crimea, at that time, if you go to Crimea, you see these billboards. See Crimea with the fascist sign. And that's exactly what Putin says, that Ukraine is a fascist country. And he is going to take, to take down the fascist regime, which is absolutely a lie. Ukrainian, Ukraine is a democracy. And uh, yeah, if I believe that there are far right elements presence, yes, they are presence and they're presence here in the US and in Germany. And that's just part of the process. Uh, but they basically what the banner says that on 16th of March, come to referendum and you have two choices, either go with Russia, this is the Russian flag, or go with the fascist Ukraine. You would see these banners all over Crimea. Uh, in 2019, uh, Zelensky, the current president was elected uh, he was well-known uh, comic, so let's say if we in the United States elected, uh, uh, let's say Jimmy Kimmel as a president, well, that would be him. Um, what is happening right now in Ukraine is truly heartbreaking and devastating. One of the things I wanted to share with you, there is a new game Ukrainians are playing with children, especially with young children. It's called Play the Turtle, so they're asking children to play a little game, lay on their stomach, open their mouth and cover their ears. That's because when bombs are falling, children are losing their, uh, their ability to hear because bombs are so strong. Uh, sunflower seeds, we already talked about that. Ukrainians are coming in front of the tanks, women, children, everybody's coming in front of the tanks and they're actually offering Russians to take sunflower seeds. And now they know what it means. At first they were very surprised because sunflower seeds are actually very delicious and incredibly nutritional, uh, but now they know. Uh, human shields in front of Russian tanks, it's really ironic because um, during the revolution when Russia wanted to go for democracy at that time, it was before all this situation with Putin and moving Russia back to a very authoritarian regime. Ukrainians uh, at, well, at that time were fighting, but Russians at that time were fighting too. And basically uh, what, uh, what was happening, Russians were putting their bodies in front of tanks. And of course, Ukrainian smoothie, a new term in Ukraine, which is Molotov cocktail, they call it Ukrainian smoothie. Um, I wanted to share with you just a few pictures uh, that uh, will give you a visual. And uh, so let me, let me see, where do I have them? I have them here. Yeah, so let me, let me share again my screen. Um, so all, uh, what we see right now uh, that uh, Ukraine is well supported around the world, uh, but uh, actually let me go to these pictures first. This is what is happening in Ukraine. These are the buildings in Ukraine that you could see. Sorry about commercials, I couldn't uh, figure out how to get rid of them. This is one of the convoys that is coming to Kyiv. This is a Russian convoy. Uh, this is what the Ukrainian smoothie in action. See people take bottles and make Molotov cocktail and they call it a uh, Ukrainian smoothie for Russians. Uh, this is a uh, uh, this is the uh, tanks uh, that uh, tanks and uh, the other Russian vehicles. You see a pile of metal. Ukrainians uh, call it now uh, valet service. Ukrainian valet service for Russians. Uh, this is how gym looks right now in Ukraine. Uh, as you could see, this is that valet service I was telling you, Ukrainian valet service for Russians. Uh, this is the explosion that you probably heard about. Uh, Russians hit uh, the tower next to the Babi Yar, uh, where Germans killed um, over 30,000 Jews in Ukraine. But this is the TV tower right next there. So there is a lot of damage there. This is how Ukraine looks right now. You could see the flags, but you also can see the devastation and destruction that is happening in that part of the world with bodies. Sorry, some images are graphic, but this is how war looks. Uh, catching saboteurs. This is one of the main bridges. You can imagine how much it will take to 
uh, to restore all that. Um, so let me go to this. The world is standing with Ukraine, and I will slowly slide down. Different countries of the world put Russian flanks, which are blue for the sky and yellow for the actual uh, for the wheat uh, that Ukraine grows. Uh, this is a, we, we see Mexican city, we see Sydney, we see Germany. Of course, this is in Germany. Demonstrations, manifestations in Germany. Uh, people paint. Uh, this, these are artists who are showing bloody tears. And again, Ukrainian colors. Uh, you all probably heard about that Russian. Nobody wanted to play soccer, which is huge in Europe, with the Ukrainian, with the with the Russian team. Uh, so that's called football there. That's where you see football, but it's called soccer in Europe. Uh, when Ukrainian, one of the Ukrainians playing for one of the UK clubs, British clubs, uh, everybody started the got up and uh, were they were singing the anthem of Ukraine in support of Ukraine. You could see people uh, behind the Ukrainian flag in Madrid, um, and you could see all over Czech Republic. Uh, look at the square covered with people in support of Ukraine, Amsterdam. Um, the major, uh, I will show you some of the major and well-known buildings in the world. And you see the colors of the Ukrainian flag, yellow and blue there, uh, Eiffel Tower in yellow and blue. Uh, people literally Buenos Aires in yellow and blue. So, but of course there is a lot of tears. Look at this, some of the iconic buildings in yellow and blue. And of course, a lot of tears, uh, a, a lot of devastation. People are, well, men are not allowed to leave Ukraine right now, men between 18 and 60 because the negative draft is in progress. Women of course are leaving um, and Ukraine is prioritizing women with children under, under, under five, people are praying. So, um, so that that's really just some of the images that you see in there. Uh, basically, I would like to conclude with a few words of hope. Uh, when humanity is at its worst, and we see that when innocent people die, but you also see humanity at its best. You could see a lot of um, uh, a, a, a lot a lot of people coming together around the world, and it's also opportunity for us as citizens, as scholars, as students who bring this world together and actually discover who we are as humans. It's, it's really that time, the test that the um, history shows us. Now, uh, solutions. The last slide that I have solutions. Um, are there solutions to prevent Russian aggression from ever happening in the future? Yes, there is. Uh, and the first thing you see, one option is clean energy sources. Russia is doing whatever it is doing and the European Union countries, some of them are not even blocking uh, Russia from SWIFT. Uh, only nine out of 300 banks in Ukraine are right now blocked from the bank, world banking system. Why? Because Germany, for example, receives 44% of oil from Russia. So if oil becomes insignificant and, uh, uh, and uh, Russia does not have that card to play, of course, uh, that would not have happened. It's good for everybody, clean energy sources, technologies are there, but why you see lobbying? Because lobbyists, um, dirty industries have a strong lobby in many parliaments of the world. And so legislators, and it depends on campaign financing, but money do speak. And uh, obviously oil industry incredibly rich. And uh, uh, if uh, the majority of campaign financing is coming from, uh, from these industries, uh, basically governments in many countries adopted, for example, tax law that favors this industry, the loopholes in tax legislation allows these industries not to pay taxes or pay lesser taxes than clean energy sources or clean industries. And what it does, that means that the price keeps being higher for the clean, uh, for, for the clean industries. If we could, uh, given even playing for clean and dirty industries, clean would, it would win. It's better for all of us because uh, dirty industries, the, um, the supply of oil is not unlimited. It will be over within 80 years. So we do need to have clean energy sources. It's better for us to breathe less allergies, less asthma, less, um, less of some sort of uh, cancer. So role of money of politics needs to be addressed. Uh, there are other solutions. We do have choices to address and prevent. Uh, but um, my first choice is clean energy sources because Russia, it's really masquerading gas station. Russia is a gas station that masquerades as the 
uh, as the uh, uh, as the country, and that's why China just abstained. China did not vote uh, at the United Nations to support Ukraine, uh, but it didn't work again. But it didn't. It just abstained. Why? Because Russia sells China oil at the incredibly at the incredibly low cost. So if we reduced the significance of oil in in this world. Uh, then, of course, Russia will lose this major, uh, major um, um, advantage. Uh, that concludes my presentation, so I will be happy to uh, now uh, open the floor to my uh, uh, fellow panelists and, uh, of course, to your questions. So I will mute my microphone and, uh, uh, Rita, you can take it from here. Uh, that was very, very insightful for many of us that are not as well knowledgeable about Ukrainian history as well as the cultural aspects. I do want to turn the floor over to Dr. Octor, who is going to address more of the American foreign policy side of this. So, Dr. Octor. Thanks so much. Thanks so much to Dr. Kamako for the um, really insightful background um, and discussion of current events. I just have a couple of really brief remarks um, that might sort of also help facilitate discussion. The first is, I think, um, in the present circumstances, we often expect that policymakers will do insert fill in the blank, whatever our preferred policy is, and will do so immediately. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind that um, policymaking during crises is not linear in any way, and it often sort of um, requires a lot of moving parts. So when we have this expectation that sort of something will be done, let's keep in mind what the complexities associated with that really involve. It takes time to gather information, um, to vet that information, to sort of consult with domestic actors in, in the US context, to consult with other countries, to negotiate sort of responses, especially if the response you're seeking is not a unilateral one. Um, the other thing to keep in mind as we have this discussion is that we operate in a context where there's very little public support for um, in the US for substantive intervention in Ukraine. Whether we agree with that or not, um, it's the context that we live in. And I don't know if anybody watched um, Biden's State of the Union address last night, where he said he would defend, the US would defend every inch of NATO territory. And the only thing I could think of was, and not an inch beyond that, right? And Ukraine isn't a NATO member currently. So there's a lot of discussion about what that means, what that looks like. Um, so the context that we're talking about is a context where US public opinion doesn't favor extreme intervention. So those of us, uh, th th those of you in the, in, you know, in the audience that sort of support significant intervention, it's an, it's an uphill battle. Um, the last thing that I just wanted to share is that um, there's become an issue of source reliability in the context of news coming out of Ukraine that you should all be aware of. There's misinformation circulating, there's images circulating from other time periods that claim to be something but aren't of a variety of things. So you can be part of the problem or you can be part of the solution. Do not share things on social media unless they're properly vetted. Share only things from reliable sources. <laughs> like you may have stumbled across some YouTube channel that you think shows something incredibly significant that all of your social media followers need to see, but unless you're certain about it, um, don't show it. So I think, you know, consult vetted sources, news organizations that are reliable that have news on the ground. Russian misinformation campaigns have occurred in the past. Um, they're occurring now. But there's also misinformation coming from um, other sources as well. So even if the misinformation favors your sort of preferred narrative or shows you know, the extreme nature of the um, of targeting of Ukrainians, it, it may not actually be reliable, even though Ukrainians certainly are under incredibly difficult circumstances. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and I will, I will sort of stop there. I look forward to hearing people's um, questions. Okay, everyone, I, you are more than welcome to put questions in the chat as well as the question and answer. I am the moderator and I'm going to do my very best with my very limited technological ability to uh, catch everyone's question first and then to uh, bring it up to the panel. Um, we've got our first question that asks whether or not it's true, and this goes back to what Dr. Octor was saying, is check your facts, that uh, Ukraine provoked this uh, aggression in order to force entry into the EU. Would anyone like to take it? Because I have some opinion as well. Well, I, I can go with that. My, my response would be, what evidence do you have that's back to what Dr. Actor said? Uh, verify your facts. No. The answer is no. Ukraine did not provoke it to force. And uh, I don't imagine any parent, look at the cute baby they have. Can you imagine any mother 
throwing her child's child under bombs or uh, provoking uh, military intervention in her country and uh, allowing, or, 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 or father for that matter. We all are actually here. You see four parents. Uh, there is no way any one of us would put our child, I'm a mother, uh, the, the, Dr. Rock is the mother, and of course, Sayed is the father. There is no way on this planet Earth that any parent would uh, put the child in danger, uh, put them on the bombs, and the conditions are horrific. Obviously, children, like what you see a cute uh, the Dr. Octor's cute baby, and uh, can you imagine this baby right now born in uh, some bomb shelter, which is... Uh, uh, wet and cold without medical care or having a, a small child or standing in line to be a refugee, run from your own home. Uh, women right now standing, even uh, Ukrainians created a separate line for women with children under five and the line still exceeds 40, 40 hours at least in a bitter cold uh, and they're just standing there and this is in a separate line when they are so-called prioritized but it's just that, that's the rule on the border. The borders are not open. Poland would not allow people to enter. You have to wet the, check the documents. You have to check the paperwork. And many children, newborn children, do not have newborn children do not have documentation. And you have to have a document, like when you're leaving the United States with a child, you have to have a proper documentation for your child. And and that creates a situation where small children are just uh, suffering. So no. That just uh, that's just a Kremlin trying to divide and conquer as usual. Yeah. So there are a number of questions that are coming in. Forgive before, me if before I can't we get... move on to the to other questions. Could I just add something to sure. this? And I want to add something. Else. Oh, of okay. course, of course. You want to go first, Said, or should I go? Uh, or you should go. Well, mine is related to another question that appeared in the um in the Q and A and or the chat, which is about the sort of um, argument, not only that Ukraine provoked this, but that Russia is um, engaging in legitimate action because ethnic Russians sort of reside in Ukraine. I think, you know, there's no uh, there's no evidence that ethnic Russians are in any sort of danger or persecuted under the Ukrainian government, and that would be necessary for an external country to sort of intervene to provide protection. So I think that narrative sort of falls flat. The question of sort of whether or not Ukraine provoked this. Ukraine is an independent country that can choose to sort of join NATO or the EU um, as it chooses. Is that potentially provocative and threatening towards Russia? It may be, and Russia certainly sort of is interpreting it in that way. But um, but that doesn't sort of remove the right of independent countries to engage in foreign policy making in the way that they deem fit. So I think um, the question of whether or not Russia views this as a threat is very different than the question of whether or not Ukraine brought this on themselves or the West sort of is responsible for it. And there's been a lot of commentary about it. John Mearsheimer is one of the big individuals currently publishing work that suggests that um, the West brought this on themselves. And I think it's largely a point of interpretation as to whether or not you see Russia's arguments of being threatened by the West as legitimate in any way. If Russia chooses to be a, a pariah state that doesn't engage in relationships with the West, then NATO may be considered threatening to Russia, but that's because of Russia's own um, own policies in that regard. Uh, I have actually two points. You know, blaming Ukraine uh, for the uh, Russian invasion is like blaming the uh, woman who has been raped for wearing uh, uh, a, a very revealing clothes. That's you, you know, it's as ridiculous as this argument. And in international relations, actually, we have the idea of the self determination. You know, we accepted the idea of the nation state after the Second World War and after the creation of the nation, uh, uh, United Nations. There is an the idea that the, each nation state is actually responsible on the, the, the domestic politics that they are taking. Uh, if Ukraine wants to join the NATO or the European Union, it's the business of the Ukrainian people who go to the election, you know, and uh, elect their own government. Unlike the Russia, that is an autocracy, it's a personalistic regime. Uh, Ukrainian is a democracy. You know, Ukraine has an election, meaningful election. The, 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 the participation is high, is, uh, is, uh, relatively free and fair election compared to the Russia we are talking about. 
So in any case, you cannot uh, blame Ukraine for the uh, Russian invasion. It was not a, a, a Ukrainian who actually uh, provoked uh, Putin to uh, intervene and invade. It was a Putin mentality and, and the Kremlin elite that wanted to restore the, the Soviet Union glorious time. They wanted to create a country like Belarus that has a puppet dictator under the control of the Putin. So please make sure you understand you shouldn't blame Ukraine as you shouldn't blame a woman who have been raped for the clothes they, they, they choose to, to wear. To address what can be done globally, um, as you have probably read or seen um, the United Nations Security Council, which Russia is a, uh, a central member as well as one that has veto power, um, voted not to acknowledge, I forget the exact terminology of the, uh, of the article, but um, voted not to label Russia as an aggressor and deem their actions as incorrect. And I found it comedic as a political scientist because you have the bully making up the rules of the sandbox. And there's several questions in both the chat and the Q&A, and this is just a reminder to all to kindly put it in the Q&A and not in the chat. What can we do, whether us as the United Nations, us um, in terms of NATO membership, what can we, do we uh, be done regionally, um, whether that's the EU or just regionally as in geographically? Those are some questions that are coming up. Um, if anyone wants to start, I'm happy to jump in at any point as well. I have a thought on the first question that was asked in the Q&A about um, Africans being discriminated against as they flee Ukraine. Um, my understanding um, from from what from my um, interaction with this material is that um, yes, <laughs> there is something to these reports that um, especially in Poland that um, particularly Nigerian students of which there was a large population in Ukraine have um, uh, were um, at times blocked from leaving the border that there was discrimination both on the part of some Ukrainian border guards who suggested that Ukrainian um, citizens uh, should be allowed to leave first into Poland um, and on the part of Polish border guards. My understanding, though, is that there's been a lot of diplomatic attention to that particular issue um, and that most um, individuals who were African students, almost, almost all students that were living in Ukraine studying have been able to flee to neighboring countries and many of them have already um, returned to Nigeria. So the initial reports seem to be legitimate, but um, it seems like there's been a diplomatic resolution to that. I have a little bit different take from uh, Dr. Akter. And I would like to inform everybody that Ukraine adopted a law to prioritize uh, women with minor children, which meaning under five years of age. So it was not directed against foreigners, but it was directed against men. I've seen this reporting from the border, and I've seen this man who were complaining how cold it is. I've seen their coats. Those coats no Ukrainian can even afford, and that could be in sub-zero. It's when my son was working on his uh, eagle, we bought him the sleeping bag. And that's how warm that coat is. Is it pleasant to sit there? No. Why Ukrainians adopted the law? Because there were multiple instances when men uh, would actually push a woman with a minor child aside. And a woman holding a child cannot be a match for any man. Also, if you look at the Red Cross reporting, women are in, why, and why Red Cross was established in the first place is to help women in the war zone. Why? Because women are easy target. Any mother would do anything for her child. They're getting raped, they're getting killed, they're getting robbed. And that's why Ukrainians established a separate line for, uh, for, the, for women with children under five and then for men as well. Now there is a separate line for, uh, for foreigners. All foreigners have different passports. You have to have a proper paperwork. And basically paperwork, they did not have these men that we're talking about. One was actually from Zimbabwe, one was from Afghanistan that we're talking on CNN. They did not have a proper paperwork. They were complaining about a woman. One was a wife who just gave a birth to the child on the day of invasion, I think. 
and she had a small and she was not allowed to cross that wasn't because she was a foreigner her child did not have the paperwork why the child didn't have a paperwork because to have a paperwork you have to have an office to have an office you have to have a building and officers in there russians bombed left and right people are running for their lives you have to have a place to process that paperwork what i would like to say that i would very much say that i'm impressed with ukrainians how quickly they established these offices and and put stuff in there and proper authorities to process these claims and authorities. Yes, these men were for 42 hours on the border. And I understand that for them, it sounds very long. It would be for me too. I'm absolutely compassionate. But if you ask me, should a woman with a child under five be prioritized or a man? And also please note, Ukrainian had a law right now that no man under 60 can leave the country. So any man who comes to the border, line, the border crossing, uh, yes, they will be stopped and there will be an extra check if they're just trying to escape the draft or do they have actually a legal reason. So you have to have a paperwork, you have to have a legal reason. And yes, it's harder for males on that border for a good reason. Ukraine is under attack and it needs to have the draft like any country that is attacked right now. So to say that Ukraine discriminates against foreigners, this is so far from, from what is happening in that, or especially to say that I already heard that Ukrainians are racist. This is Kremlin propaganda. Ukrainians, uh, look, I grew up in that country. We had parties, we, we, we went to school with people from Africa, from Cuba, from China, from, you, you would see all people of all colors, all religions. It never occurred to any of us to think anything less of anybody else. That's how we were raised. Ukraine is quite different. We, it seems like frequently we apply the logic from the United States to the countries that don't have that culture, don't have a history of grabbing people in Africa and dragging them somewhere in chains. We didn't have slavery. We didn't have a lot of these things. So uh, it's, it's a different logic. It's a different culture. So Ukrainians are probably most inviting, hospital, and an incredibly compassionate nation. To say that they would discriminate against anybody because they're foreigners or have different color of skin or religion for that matter, uh, that, is just, that is just not factually true. We addressed other things on what can we be done um, in regards to sanctioning Russia. And the, this week we have seen many governments around the world trying to impose um, softer sanctions, for example, cutting trade, discouraging, um, um, but what am I trying to think of? Um, and and, and in, in addition to, I believe last night, um, there was some discussion in the State of the Union about no-fly zones. And I would be curious if someone on the panel would like to address what does uh, closed airspace or flying over foreign airspace mean with respect to the Russians for their military? as well as just for their economy to continue their day-to-day? -day. The problem actually with no-fly zone that has been repeatedly uh, proposed by the Ukrainian and rejected by the NATO and America is the possibility of confrontation between Russia and the NATO will increase rapidly. You know, uh, and that's one of the concerns of NATO and the United States that they try to uh, stop any direct confrontation with the Russian. You know, uh, right now, Vladimir Putin is running that country. We know that he's not a rational person anymore. He somehow detached the reality. He thought that, you know, uh, invasion of the Ukraine doesn't have too much consequences. West is so weak and the United States is so distracted after withdrawing from Afghanistan. So all of his calculation was, it's not a big deal. There will be some, you know, economic sanctions. And then like, you know, 2014 after the annexation of Karima or 2008 after invading Georgia. But don't forget this uh, uh, on attached with the reality, this uh, crazy leader has nuclear weapon. And uh, there is no way that you cannot not think that maybe Putin used that if it's in danger. Just, you know, nobody thought that the, uh, Russia will attack Ukraine. One month ago, 
just read all of these new analysts in media, in TV, in newspapers. Almost all of the Western academia and think tank policymakers said, no, there is no way. It is only a maneuver and they, you know, the, the Russia is not going to attack. Why Russia should attack Ukraine? And we saw that the Russia attack Ukraine. So if you ask yourself why Russia or Putin, you know, should uh, you know, use nuclear weapons, again, ask this question. If you are in a state of the Putin as, as a, you know, on complex, on attack is the reality and in, in danger, you can use that. So that's the most important concern of the Western country and, and, and can be understood. And I, I really believe that, uh, you know, even I thought that the West uh, will not impose sanctions uh, over the, the Russian economy or, you know, cut the Russia from the street in most countries. Uh, or, or Germany that actually uh, canceled the Nord Storm Second. So the Europe is getting together, and that's a good sign. The US is supporting the Ukraine, that's a great sign. I think uh, the the, the, the global awareness of, of the danger of the, the, the dictatorship and, and you know autocracy. Uh, we have to support Ukraine as much as we can. We have to provide the military, uh, you know, uh, equipment, weapons, uh, we have to. Uh, somebody actually today uh, uh, proposed that we need to have a new Marshall Plan after the first, after the Second World War to, to support Ukraine. I think all of this is great, but I really don't think that, you know, uh, no-fly zone uh, will help Ukraine too much. Uh, uh, I, I really, uh, I, 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 I'm concerned about uh, the, the, the military confrontation with Russia and, you know, the escalation of military that has a devastating uh, consequence. So I understand what they are saying, no flying on. I, I'm trying to find out how we can help Ukraine more and more. And it's a very difficult thing. And I agree with uh, with Dr. Gokar. It's difficult, and there are all those options on the table. But I would like to address something that hasn't been addressed yet anywhere, in, even in the media. One place where Putin is clearly winning is ideological war, uh, and having any government needs legitimacy and support of their people. I was following some groups on the internet, and I see that Russians and Ukrainians are not that different. They are actually all agree that killing innocent people is wrong. However, Russians strongly believe that Ukrainians are Nazis, uh, which includes being racist, discriminatory, uh, being cruel, be killing people. Uh, and the way the propaganda works, they're cutting. It's like, you know, when you bring a blind man to see a, an elephant and he grabs a tail and says that elephant looks like a, like a tail. That's what's happening to Russian population. And where I believe can be done right now, what was done during the Second World War, we need uh, to uh, make a hole in the wall of defense against information that the Kremlin built. Russians do not have access to information. Facebook is limited. They are full, they are the news channels in Russia are only showing Donbas, Lugansk. They do not show what's happening in the world. They do not show the true picture. They even not telling their people how many Russian soldiers were killed already in Ukraine. So if we could get a uh, if the West could get best, I don't know, hackers, if you wish, and just uh, start uh, uh, feeding information to Russians, find the channel uh, that is still open there to give Russians information. Russians who found a way to get information, they're on the streets. More than 6,000 Russian people are in prisons right now. And this is really the end of their life pretty much because they will not be allowed admission to university. They will not be allowed to have any decent job. And Russians are coming out on the streets protesting the war more and more often. But the, even the TV personalities who just open their mouths uh, to say some truth about what's happening in Ukraine, guess what? They close their show in the middle of the transmission. So they would not allow Russians to hear the truth. So I believe this is time to fight ideological war, give uh, Russians information, but also 
have our narrative and give the true narrative and true story of what is happening versus this Russian version that all Ukrainians are Nazis and uh, criminals. And uh, moreover, Putin said that, that the Ukrainian leadership is drug addicts. Do you see them as drug? Do they behave like drug addicts? I mean, they, basically, he told that uh, the Russians are fighting this righteous war to protect children of Donbas and uh, Lugansk. And that's where we're losing the war because Russians do not hear any other narratives. So in addition to weapons, words do matter. What people know matters. And getting this somehow this information through whatever channels we have, just informing Russians, they can put pressure on their government uh, in addition to pressure that we're putting financial and military on them. But putting ideological pressure is a huge part of this puzzle and huge part of a solution. We need to get Russian population on the right side of history. They just don't know. They totally believe that they're fighting the righteous war and they're protecting children of Donbass and Lugansk and getting rid of horrible Nazis who discriminate against people, killing Russians. And you see multiple people of Russian ethnicity in Ukraine. They don't even call themselves Russian Ukrainians. They call themselves Ukrainians, but they show passports and they show Russian and say, I'm, I'm Russian. They say it in Ya Ruski. They say it in Russian. Ya Ruski, Ya Vam Pokazavusvu passport. They're arguing with these people and they're saying, Look, you're here to protect me. I don't need your protection. Go away. And then they throw their bodies on the tanks. I talked to multiple women who are right now sitting in bomb shelters and Yesterday, I received heartbreaking texts from my people who, who, from my friends in Ukraine, who were like, today Russians are going to do the bomb, indiscriminate bombing to clean Kharkiv of those evil Russian uh, killers, uh, Nazis, and uh, it may be our last night. I mean, how do you react to that when you receive that? Or when they're hunting for bread right now, they don't have food, they have barely access to water. One of my girlfriends said her husband went on patrol and she's waiting for him and hoping he will come back. She's my friend from the elementary school. She's in our elementary school with her, with her daughter, but she's in a bomb shelter. These people are not Nazis. They're not, they are not anything like Nazis. They're kind, they're decent. It, it's not what Putin says. So ideological solution, ideological war. I want to address what Dr. Kamilko talked about, what is now the information that needs to be corrected to the people, the Russian people. If you notice a lot of the sanctions that um, foreign countries have imposed to kind of strong arm uh, Putin's regime into stopping what he is doing is really being disproportionately burdened by the people of Russia. So when we see a uh, financial crisis by way of their monetary, uh, of the ruby, uh, ruble, um, or uh, the inability for uh, Russian university students, for example, to be able to go abroad to university or to get employment or to be welcomed in other countries, it's really punishing the Russian people, which we are hoping would force them to petition their government, right? In a democracy, we're making the argument that the people of the democracy have the ability to change it. Unfortunately for the people of Russia, we wouldn't necessarily classify, I 100% would not classify Russia as a democracy. It's an, a liberal democracy at best, um, more elements of authoritarianism than democracy. Uh, I am concerned equally for my friends and um, relatives that live in Ukraine, specifically um, in the cities that Dr. Kamelko mentioned. Um, I am equally worried about uh, China continuing to buy Russian oil and the money being funded or funding the military. These are ongoing problems that I don't think we have the time to address today. There are also many more questions in the chat that I'm sorry we just didn't have the time to get to, but I am happy and I'm more than happy to um, email correspond with anyone, as I'm sure the other panelists are as well. We have just a few more minutes. Um, if any of the panelists want to have any closing remarks, I have two announcements at the end. I have actually to say something. You know, according to all of the institutions who rank democracy around the world, Russia since 
2014 is a consolidated autocracy. It is not, they have the election, but the election is completely, you know, unfair and unfair. So there is no doubt that Russia is the authoritarian. The, the second thing, I, I really believe that not only this war is unfolding before our eyes, the history is unfolding before our eyes. You know, we are in a very important time right now that this war can let the Third World War, you know, if you just read about the First World War and Second World War, the First World War just started by assassination of the Prince of, uh, you know, Austria, uh, Hungarian Empire in Sarajevo. Just one uh, assassination led to the Third World War. And the Second World War was, uh, uh, you know, uh, very easily started when Hitler came to the power and then when the West was not ready to defend its own value when Germany decided to, to, to expand its territory. So we are in, in, in a time that this conflict can very easily get you know, out of the control and start a third world war. Even if it's not the third world war, we can go to the second cold war that we finished between 1945 to 1989. There is a possibility that we enter a new cold war with, the, with, the, with the Russia, try to restore the Soviet empire, you know, with a new ideology. At that time was Marxist communism, right now is authoritarian populism. So for every, uh, all of our students, I really want to, to, you know, to pay attention to what is going on around the world. Third, uh, you know, it's very important to know, as we know that what happened, you know, as a pandemic is, is we are living in a globalized world. There is no way that you think I'm living in the, in the US, I'm safe from the war. No, there is nothing, you know, like that. Everything is very fast and rapidly expands to the globe. The second is, please uh, get your information from, you know, as the Sikha said, as others said, from the, the, the legitimate sources. Either left or right, I really don't care, as long as they are, you know, objective, you know, objective. So please make sure, I, I read a few actually comments here, and I'm completely familiar with authoritarian propaganda machine, how they are working, how they are actually pumping this information. The Russia is, is exactly a leader, China, Iran, Venezuela, and others. So if you see a video on TikTok or on Snapchat or on the Facebook, don't take it seriously as long as you, you know, you, you, you check the facts. No, you know, and the last thing about the, 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 the racism, yes, you know, racism is everywhere. You know, as an Iranian, we are racist toward Afghani people or, you know, not Iranian people. I'm sure racism, you can find it in the U.S. in everywhere that you are, uh, uh, the human beings are living. But the right now, the important thing is to, in, to think about the invasion of a country are coming to the Ukraine and destroying this country. They are bombarding the cities after the cities. People have been killed and nobody really cared. In the first, in the first six days of the war, more than, more than about 560 people have been killed from the Russian and you don't hear it from any sources. There's a soldier, because that's not very important for the Russia. You know, for the Russia, is really, the, the human casualty is not important. For the West, it's very important to, you know, even if you want to lose one soldier, you have to, uh, you have to uh, respond to your social constituents. So make sure you understand what is going on and be vigilant about the consequences. If I may, I have 20 seconds, one comment and one thought that I didn't share. I have a little bit different take from what I see on the news that it's all about Ukraine. I don't see it this way. I see it as a continuation of Cold War. We as Americans thought we won the war, war, Cold War, but I believe Putin never thought so. It was the biggest disaster and embarrassment for the Soviets. And of course he was part of the elites and he just never believed that it was over. So he was quiet, he regrouped and now he's attacking. Ukraine is a tool, it's not the goal. The goal are us Americans at attack. It is an attack on our Western way of life, on democracy, on freedom and liberty for all. So I, I see it as a continuation of Cold War. 
or basically active phase of the world war. And I also see that Ukraine is just a tool. And if you think it's the last one, it, it's not. If he takes Ukraine, he will go further and he will start encroaching on others. Like right now, Sweden and Finland, for example, are not parts of the NATO. So you can imagine what will happen to them and the others. And if you think that uh, that's going to stop, no, Ukraine is just a tool. The goal are us. And there are more, more than one way is giving his oil to hurt us and hurt our way of life and our quality of life and our freedom. So I believe it's an attack on freedom and democracy. I'll just take 20 seconds to, to make some concluding remarks. Um, I think that um, one interesting thing to come out of this that we can conclude now, even though it is the early stages of all of this, is that we are likely to see a resurgence of the significance of NATO um, as a result. I mean, if anybody that's followed NATO politics, that was probably pretty boring to follow NATO politics for the last 10 years or so, because there wasn't really that much there because they had no substantive ideological enemy um, the way that they did during the Cold War. But Putin has made himself that ideological enemy at this point in time and really unified NATO in a way that makes it more meaningful than it had been previously. Um, if you look even in the last day or so, public opinion in Finland for joining NATO is far, far higher than it has been at any other point. Previously, not a majority. Now we are seeing those kinds of statistics. Um, so these kinds of things, you know, it's interesting. I think that there was a bit of a strategic miscalculation by Putin in many ways, one militarily um, and, some, and some other things that we don't have time to get into. But another is in not appropriately understanding how this would coalesce NATO members and really make NATO a more significant actor, even though it was previously on the decline. And just to add to what um, Dr. Groh said, if anybody wants to follow up on any of the comments that I've made, um, uh, you're welcome to send me an email and we can sort of discuss more um, via email. With that said, we are past the one o'clock hour. There are a few announcements to make. As many of you are aware, this is one of the activities or events that can count towards Beyond the Classroom Challenge event. Um, Susan had put it in the chat for everyone. I am gonna copy it and repost it. And in addition to that, some of you are here, and again, I so welcome all of you for being here, that are probably gonna get extra credit from uh, professors like myself and Dr. Kamelko. Uh, we have your registration information, but just to make it easier on us, if you can kindly put your full name and the class that you're in, um, then that way we can route it to the right person into the regular chat. Um, I will save it. Other than that, kindly um, uh, make your way and sign off. I thank you, uh, fellow panelists, for your time and your passion on um, discussing and promoting um, um, an a event like this on our campus. Um, RJ, did you see that it says the chat is disabled? A couple of people commented in the Q&A that the chat is disabled. Well, I don't know. What there that goes means. that idea. So please, okay, we will just, we'll, I'll follow up on the report then instead. Um, I will follow up on the report instead. Um, once you registered and you have attended, we've got your information and I'll do, I'll get it routed to um, all of the professors. Thank you for your time. I am gonna conclude this session and I hope you all have a great day. Bye.